גם? רגע. Okay, folks, it is no more nagging. I'm done. If you haven't started yet, it's too late anyway, so no point right now. No. But, but, but though, uh, thank you for getting the, those summary sheets in. I think I got, I think the total, I, I, I thought, I think I got in total 275 out of the 300, which is pretty good. Okay. So today I'm going to use what you turned in as the basis for reviewing the whole class. And be but before I do that, a few, few logistical details. I know a few of you are taking the early exam tomorrow. It's from 1 to 3 in room 355. So I, I saw about 15 people signed up for it. If you've changed your mind, that's completely okay. You want to take it on Friday. That's okay, but if you want to take the exam tomorrow, it'll be from 1 to 3 in room 355. Um, the regular exam, of course, is 10 to 12 on, Monday, uh, on Friday. Okay, so it, it'll be in Paulson, and there'll be one, it'll be two, uh, Paulson and one other room. They're still trying to figure out because NYU takes control of the rooms for the finals week. So the Stern can't actually give me permission until NYU okays it. So by late today, I should have the other room as well. So if there's going to be a breakup of seating, it'll be on, on Friday. The projects themselves are due by 5 p.m. today. So a few of you mentioned 8 p.m. I don't know where the 8 p.m. came in. I don't think I've ever mentioned 8 p.m. any, any time. Uh, you know what that is? It's the damn Pacific time <laughs> kicking in again. It, it's got, you know what? If it, if it takes until 8, go ahead and turn it in 8 p.m. It's what the extra three hours going to do anyway, right? I'm actually catching a flight to London at 7, so it's not like I can do much between, you know, as many. If you can get it in by 5, at least I can open and grade some of them on the, on the plane. The way the grading will work is I want to make sure you CC everybody in the group because when I grade it, I will send it back to the entire group. I'll just reply all. So if you've added people there who are not part of your group, that's your problem, not mine. So just make sure that you don't CC the whole class because then when I reply all, I'll be replying to everybody in the class. So you know, all kinds of crazy, crazy things can happen. But the grades will be embedded in the PDF files, so you'll see them as comments and grades right there. So nothing physical to show up. And uh, it'll be graded out of 30, so you, when you see the score, you're not going to freak out. You know, it's not 20, 27 out of 100. And the final exam, of course, you know, once it gets done, will get graded and the usual rules will apply. So let's go back to the very beginning. Okay? I mean, I told you that this project was essentially going to run through the whole class, and you can see that it covered pretty much everything. And along the way, I hope you found some things that are reality, but you don't really, you know, kind of grapple with them until you actually run into them. The first is, as many of you found out, there are very few facts on the ground and lots of opinions. You thought net income was a fact, but then you realize that even net income is hazy. You know, lease commitments are a fact, but then lease commitments are hazy. You look at three different sources. They give you three different numbers for the same thing. You say, what the heck do I do? Just get used to it. it this is the way it is. Okay? It doesn't mean that you can't do analyses. It just means that some numbers are going to be different in different places. And the one thing I hope you never do is take ratios that are computed elsewhere. Because then you, it's not because they're computed badly or wrong. You just don't control them. 
always do things on your own when you do things like ratios because that, that way at least even if you don't like what you're doing, you know what you've done. The real world is a messy place. Nothing in the real world ends with three zeros. Now that's, you know, there are decimals and, you know. And as you're, you know, for many of you, I think at least three or four of you did Boeing. During the course of the semester, the ground under you shifted. And it, it is, again, something you don't control. I know there were at least a few people over the weekend who emailed me in a panic saying, look, you told us not to pick a money losing company. I picked a money making company when the project started, but it's become a money losing company. Should I change companies now? What do you think? I'm some sadistic monster. It says on Friday, the day before, the, the weekend before, you have to change a company and pick a different one. But it can happen. There's nothing you can do about it. And now think about last week. Just last week, how much the market itself shifted. While you were valuing the stock, it probably went from being overvalued to undervalued because the stock drops 10%. That's exactly what can happen. And I let you pick your own companies. And here are a list of companies that were picked the most across the class. Okay? So a lot of Chipotle <laughs> and Netflix. I don't know whether that tells me a lot about what you've been doing all semester or whether you really like those companies. Eh? Lululemon is always there. Don't ask me what it is about this company. In the valuation class, put together the two valuation classes, 16 people valued Lululemon. Eh? So again, whatever, there's a draw to this company that people want to value it. But, you know, and the reason I pick, let people pick the same company is very simple. No two pe you know, people doing the same company get the same number. So these are five people who did Activision. First, two of them called it Activision, and the other two called it Activision Blizzard. So basically, it's the same company. That's not the big issue. Your betas are different. Your Jensen's alphas, two are negative, three are positive. Okay? <laughs> the R squareds range from 0.1%, which I hope is a decimal moved over the wrong way. Sometimes it can happen to 23.4%, no? there isn't a single number that matches up, and it never has. That's why I've never had an issue with the same people doing it. You, I'm sorry, I mean, I think all of you found it to be under leaven, but the degree varied. Your dividends are, no, I didn't even know what to say. This, this, <laughs> I will leave that until, and, and I can tell when you did the project by just looking at the price per share you report, right? So if it's from January, you got it done really early, or you just went back to January. So it doesn't matter that multiple people are doing it. Not, I mean, so if you are one of the people who did Activision, don't freak out. I'm not sitting there saying, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer, I'm going to take points off. On some things, you know, you should get a degree of freedom. Some are really off the reservation, in which case something went wrong numerically. And I don't have a way of finding out until the actual numbers come in. Let's go back to the very beginning. I started this class by talking about the conflicts of interest, the corporate governance issue. And essentially, the question we're asking is, where in my company does the power lie? Let's review very quickly. Managers in publicly traded companies make the big investment financing dividend decisions. In theory, they're hired and fired by stockholders, but in practice, they often have you know, stockholders have little power over managers. So managers often put their interests over stockholder interests. Lenders lend money to companies, but if they don't protect themselves, they get ripped off. Firms reveal information to markets, but often that information is delayed or, you know, or at least massaged to make, it, make the company look good. And markets are not particularly efficient either. They move all over the place. And finally, there are social costs and benefits that are under the surface in all of these companies. So one of the first questions I asked you, and this is, a, this is perhaps the most qualitative part of the project, is looking at your company, make a judgment. Where does the power lie? Does it lie with stockholders? Does it lie with managers? Does it lie somewhere in the middle? So let's start with what you found. Across your companies, in 50%, in 9% in of company, uh, companies, you had stockholders have high power, one in 10. In about 40% of companies, you have stockholders have some power. And in half of all of your companies, you said stockholders have no power. And this was 
I mean, I, I, I don't have the breakdown by region until I actually read your reports, but my guess is that if you look at the U.S. companies, there's a little more skewing towards stockholders having power. But even in the U.S., which is regarded as a bastion of corporate governance and strength, stockholders don't have that much power. So that's a reality we have to accept with publicly traded companies. Much as we like to think of ourselves as stockholders and owners of the company, the reality is that ownership doesn't come with the kind of power to change management at most of these companies. This is something I can't do yet for your projects because when your projects come in, one of the things I'm going to ask you is who's the marginal investor? Somebody remind me again, why do we care? First, what t you know, when, you, when I ask you who's your marginal investor, what, what am I asking you? I'm asking you for a name or a type of investor. I'm asking for a type of investor. Is it institution? And why do, why do we care who your marginal investor is? But, and tell me how they can make a difference. Obviously, it must make a big difference in how we frame the company. What is it that they make the most difference in? Yeah, that's a corporate governance issue. But think in terms of risk. Why does it matter who the marginal investor is? Because it's the entire... That's true, but that could be true. So that's true. Any marginal investor can do it, but why does that type of marginal investor matter? Because any marginal investor is going to be able to do it. I completely, there is a corporate governance issue. There's Exactly, because all our risk and return models are built on diversification. Often in modern portfolio theory, people get into this beta versus a multi-factor model. Every one of these models is built on the basis that investors are diversified. So the reason we care who, what type of investor is your marginal investor is to, make an, is to try to at least answer that question. And if your marginal investor is an institutional investor, we make a leap of faith. That institutional investors are more likely to be diversified. No guarantees, but they're more likely to be diversified. Therefore, what follows? You can use beta or beta or any of those measures of risk that focus only on him. I didn't force any of you to go down that private business route, though there were at least five companies with, you know, which were private companies that you did. But there you might want to think about what happens when the marginal investor is not diversified? And when you have an individual become your marginal investor rather than an institution, things get a little shakier. And this is why in emerging markets, you can sometimes have publicly traded companies run like private businesses because they're closely held and controlled by an individual who also happens to be a marginal investor. So when I get your projects, one of the things I'll be keeping tabs on as I go through the projects is, when you tell me who the marginal investor is, I'll just put a tick mark, institution, individual. And actually, all I need to do is put a tick mark on the individual, because most of you, at some uh, after you've gone through your list of top 17, have probably concluded it's an institutional investor. And frankly, we don't care who the institutional investor is, because that institutional investor can be here today. And so it can be Vanguard now and Fidelity next quarter. So that basis, that the investor is diversified, allows us to then go to the next step. We need hurdle rates. In particular, we need a cost of equity. And if we accept the fact that investors are diversified, then we measure that risk with a beta or betas. So let's remind ourselves again, beta measures the risk added to a diversified portfolio. And that beta doesn't come from a regression, much as we, that's the way we look it up. It comes from the type of business you're in. The more discretionary your business, the higher your beta. How much you have in fixed costs, more fixed costs, higher beta and how much you have in debt. And to get to a cost of equity, I need to start with the risk-free rate. That risk-free rate will depend on what currency you're doing your analysis in. Your rupees, yen, pesos, euros, dollars. Your risk-free rate, if you, it's truly risk-free, can have no default risk in it. Which is not an issue if you have a AAA-rated entity like the US or Germany issuing a government bond. But if you're trying to get a risk-free rate in Indian rupees or Indonesian rupee or Brazilian rupees, you have a little bit more work to do because you've got to take the government bond rate and take out the default risk. The risk premium reflects where you do business. So basically, every number in this equation has a role to play. Your risk-free rate reflects your currency choice. Your beta reflects what business or businesses you're in. And your equity risk premium reflects where you do business. Try to keep them separate, because otherwise you're going to end up double counting. And what I mean by that 
is if you decide an emerging market company is riskier, that's fine. But then don't try to bring it into your beta and your risk premium and your, what you call your risk free rate, because that will be triple counting for the same risk. So when we talked about betas, we talked about the two basic ways of estimating betas. The standard, and this is still the default in which most people get betas, is they run a regression. Or actually, they let somebody else, Barra, Bloomberg, run the regression for them. They take the slope of the line, and they make that the beta. By now, you've heard my arguments against regression betas. So remind me what they are. What are the problems with regression betas? Backward looking. Because you need past returns, what else? Noisy. Noisy as in big standard error. And reflecting your company as it used to be and if there are changes. And you can't get it for a private company. So I try to push you as much as I could. Now, I think I, was not, I wasn't particularly subtle about this, right? I said, we're going to dig a hole and bury regression betas. I think that's about as direct as I could get. And I said, we're going to replace it with a bottom-up beta. A bottom-up beta, you start with the business of businesses you're in. You look at the revenues, at least, for those businesses if you can't get value. You look up the betas for each of the businesses, you take a weighted average. That gives you the unlevered beta for your company. And then you bring in your debt-to-equity ratio, you come up with the levered beta. Why is that better? First, by averaging across companies in a sector, you get a more precise beta, the law of large numbers. Second, if your company's changed its business mix, you can reflect that in your beta. And third, you can estimate a beta for Uber the day it goes public because you don't need past prices to do it. So every year, I keep pushing and pushing to see if I can ever get to 100% of the people in the class using bottom-up betas. I'm almost there. There, 89% of you use bottom-up betas, 9% of you use regression betas, 2% use some word letter other than B or R, which either means you were really tired and you entered something you didn't mean to, or you have some unique way of estimating betas that, that I'll find out when the reports come in. I'll pre, uh, no, the, again, I will not, if you use a regression beta, I'm not going to say that's wrong. I'll at least preempt what, the, what arguments you probably given for why you went with the regression beta. If anybody here used the regression beta with a different argument, let's add to the list. The first is my company is unique. I could not find comparable companies. And what's the pushback against that? Because let's play this out. Because you're going to face this in, you know, if you, what's, the, what, what's your pushback on that? You, you've defined your business too narrowly. If you define your business too narrowly, of course your company is going to be unique. So the pushback is define your business more broadly. The second is my company is in only one line of business. I think if you use that argument, you're missing the reason why we use bottom up betas. The law of large numbers applies even if you're in only one business. So if you're only a steel company, you still will get a better estimate of the beta for your company by taking an average across steel companies rather than one. I'm not, please don't go and rewrite your entire project between now and five o'clock. As I said, this is not what I'm, this is not, this is not the, the high ground or the low ground where this battle is going to be fought. I'm just you know, giving you at least the counter arguments. And finally, and a lot of you had this because I heard about it over the last couple of weeks. And here's how it will go. My regression beta is 0.7. My bottom up beta is 1.9. They're too different. What should I do? Now, let me ask you a question. If your bottom up betas were always pretty close to your regression betas, why would we spend our time doing this in the first place, right? It's because they're going to be different that we do them. And the argument I'm making is when they're different, trust the bottom-up beta more than the regression beta. It's precisely because they'll be different that they do it. So don't let the fact that they're different cause you angst, because that's exactly the rationale for doing this. Now, as I show you what you found, you're going to get a profile of a typical project company. Okay. This is actually the distribution of betas across your 275 companies. And the median beta you had is about 1.07. The average beta is about 1.14. So remember, the average beta across all companies is 1. The median is going to be pretty close to 1. So what's the first thing you're telling me about your companies? You pick, in general, 
riskier companies than average. And as we go on, you're going to see me add to this list. So your typical analysis, company for analysis is riskier than average, but not by much. But here's the interesting thing. If you look at the first and the third quartile, the 25th and the 75th percentile, your betas lie between 0.82 and 1.26. You know the lesson you should take away from this is? You go across this class. The big differences in cost of capital are not coming from betas being wildly divergent. They might come from being in different currencies, right? You're doing an analysis in Turkish lira, you're going to end up with a higher discount rate. Or what's the other thing that can cause discount rates? To be where you do business. If you're in emerging markets and that's where you do the bulk of your business, betas are not the reason costs of capital vary across companies. Next week, I'm supposed to be talking at a portfolio manager's conference. I don't know how I got roped into this. The day after you're in a valuation exam, I've got a grading, grading to do. But I needed a break from it. And they emailed me yesterday saying, you're going to go after somebody whose entire session is going to be about how betas have destroyed active money management. I said, really? That's his thesis? This is like the cab driver, the taxi cab driver who claims, if smartphones had never come along, there would be no Uber and Lyft, which is technically true. But the reason smartphones allowed Uber and Lyft to destroy you was because you were a horrifically badly designed business in the first place. There is no worse business in the world than active money management. To argue that this, the reason you were destroyed by ETFs and index funds is because betas came along is looking at the wrong target. You know what the target is? Get a big mirror. Look into it. There's your reason. That's exactly all I'm going to say because I'm going to be in a foul mood by that day because I've been grading for eight days consecutively. I'm not preparing any presentation. I'll just bring a mirror, hold it up, say, there's your reason, and walk away. And let's see how that plays out. So as you go through these companies, that's some, so your typical company is riskier than average. Your typical company also is doing better than the market. Jensen. As a positive, remember the average across all companies should be. And some of that is my fault. Because what did I stop you from picking? All money losing companies and financial service companies. I've saved you from a, you know, if, so those of you who felt this was a constraint, I saved you from a ton of trouble down the, so the, the positive Jensen Alpha at least, but even among your companies, about a third of your companies did have negative Jensen Alpha. So I'm going to come back to this. Because some of these companies are actually looking very good on things like excess returns. So I'm going to ask you, how is it possible for a company to earn well above its cost of capital and be a bad investment at the same time? Because for many of you, that, that, those numbers coexisted. Your R squared, basically, there's not much to read. But the key thing to remember is the R squares are in the 15, 20, 25 percent range. Do you see why that diversification question became a key one? Because if your investors are not diversified, we're ignoring 75% of the risk that they will care about. They're going to think that the discount rates you come up with look too low to them. And the reason is they're looking at total risk rather than the port. So the betas measure only the R squared portion of the risk, and the rest we're assuming gets diversified away. So that's the first part, taking your regression apart, the beta, the alpha, the R squared. That, cost of, that beta gave us a cost of equity. That cost of equity feeds into a cost of capital. And to get from cost of equity to cost of capital, I need two other numbers. I need a cost of debt, and I need weights for debt and equity. To get the cost of debt, you start with the risk-free rate, the same risk-free rate that you started the cost of equity with, and you add a default spread. Some of you got lucky. In what sense? Your companies had bond ratings, in which case use the S&P or Moody's ratings. You looked up the default spread and you moved on. I would suggest even if you had an easy company, that at least think about those companies when it wasn't as easy. Because you will have a lot of those companies in the future that you're analyzing which don't have a rating, in which case what do we do? We take an interest coverage ratio, we come up with a synthetic rating, we get a cost of debt. And for, some of, for most of your companies, that work. But for some of your companies, the operating income is so low that any kind of ratio you computed gave you a double C, single C rating. Many of your companies, there's another issue too. If you do a synthetic rating for your company, you get a triple A rating for your company. And your response is, no way. 
will this company have a AAA rating? I know many of you wrestle with that. But while you were wrestling with it, you know, those of you emailed me, I said, tell me what your debt ratio is. And for many of these companies, which looked unrealistically highly rated, what kind of debt ratio did you have? A really low debt ratio. So usually a tech company with tiny interest expenses. And it's true that this company will never have a AAA rating. And my suggestion is, why don't you put a triple B rating, see what happens to your cost of capital. You know what the result is, right? When you have a 5% debt ratio, what difference does it make whether you're AAA or triple B rated? It's not going to move your cost of capital. It's kind of a general lesson. When you're obsessing about a detail, step back and ask, does this even matter? If at the in the larger scheme of things, it's not going to move things very much. Just make an assumption and move on, because this is not where you want to spend your time on the analysis. Of course, you've got to get an after-tax cost of debt, so you have to multiply by 1 minus the tax rate. And that tax rate has to be, by now you know, effective or marginal. For cost of debt, it's always got to be a marginal tax rate. Tell me why. It's always the last dollar of income that you're protecting against it with your interest expenses. And that marginal tax rate comes from the tax code. You will often not find it in your financials because the companies don't have to report the marginal tax rate. So look at the tax code. The weights have to be market value weights. Yes? Which is fine, then use it. OK, take, give me an example. What company, what, what's the company we're talking about? You know what they're trying to tell you. Their income is in the US. They're taxed at the U.S. tax rate. That's, that's the message they're sending. Whether you want to take it or not is up to you. But when you report a marginal tax rate, that's very different from your local country tax rate. You're saying, remember, you get taxed where you make your income, not, not where you produce stuff. So that's usually the explanation. If you're a multinational, sometimes those marginal tax rates can reflect where you get your income and you get taxed and where you get the interest expenses. And take it, I mean, if that's, I, un, unless this is a company that you don't trust on every dimension, in which case you should take nothing that they tell you about numbers that are not actual numbers with a grain of salt. That's what, that's the information you'd get. Sure. In fact, it has to be, right? Why? Because if the effective tax rate is lower than the marginal tax rate, what are you doing? You're deferring taxes. At some point in time, what's going to happen? Those taxes will catch up with you. And when they catch up, there will be periods where your effective tax rate actually runs above your marginal tax rate, at least for a period until your deferred taxes get caught up. This is a cycle. Early on in a company's life, the effective tax rate will be lower than the marginal tax rate. There will be a point at which the effective tax rate will get higher. Then the two will converge. But over time, that tax, you, know, you can't defer taxes forever. To the extent that these are true deferred taxes, they will eventually catch up with you. Can the effective tax rate, some of you had negative effective tax rates. How is that possible? What is that telling you? US companies, at least, can maintain two sets of books. One is for taxes, and one is for reporting. And in your tax books, if you reported an income, you paid taxes on it. And then in your reporting books, if you had a loss, for whatever reason, you, you took a restructuring charge, you can actually have taxes because the IRS says, no, that expense is not tax deductible. So you can have a negative tax rate. So effective tax rates can be negative, they can be zero, they can, and that's why in valuation, you can take your effective tax rate, but you should still make a judgment on, do I want to build this in as my tax rate going forward? So I looked at your debt ratios. Remember, one of the things I hoped you would get out of this was a sense of perspective. So one of the things you hear out there is how US companies are getting incredibly over levered, right? I mean, this is a story you see rolling around. Well, at least with your companies, that is definitely not the case. Because if you look at your debt ratios, I think the, the, there were about not, one third of your, and more than, uh, uh, close to one third of your companies, the debt ratio was less than 10%. And this is including lease commitments as debt. So this is, think of as a preview of what the debt ratios will look like next year when the accountants get around to doing the right thing. Your average debt ratio is 33%, but the median is only 17%. What does that tell you? 
There are some outliers here of 70, 80, 90 percent debt which are pushing out the debt ratios. And in fact, there, 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 there are a couple of companies with 70 to 80 percent actual debt ratios. So that's a breakdown of actual debt ratios. Those debt ratios, of course, feed into your cost to capital. So at this stage, we have a hurdle rate for the company. Why do we need that hurdle rate? If we're doing investment analyses, this becomes the discount rate. We used to discount cash flows if they're pre-debt cash flows. And we're getting post-debt cash flows, and of course, we use the cost of equity. So we're doing traditional NPV analysis. We take cash flows, we discount them, we come up with the net present value. But if you're looking at an entire company where you can't project out cash flows in individual projects, we use a shortcut. It comes with its limitations. Where we take the accounting returns, okay? and if it's after-tax operating income, we divide by the capital invested in the company. And we compute capital invested by taking book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. And I've said this before. It's the only place in finance we ever use book values. We get a return on capital, we compare it to the cost of capital, and if you want to get fancy, we multiply it by the capital invested. It's called an EVA, but it tells you exactly the same thing. So if you're earning more than your cost of capital, we make a judgment that on average, you're delivering value. Of course, that has got to come with an asterisk because these are accounting numbers, and you might actually not be delivering value, but your accountant wrote off half the capital invested last year, making you look good. But that's the cost you pay for having an accounting number. Of course, you could do the same thing with return on equity, net income divided by book equity and comparing it to the cost of equity. The key is to stay consistent. You can never compare return on capital to cost of equity or return on equity to cost of capital because those are mismatched. So here's what you found for your company. So add this to the list of things about your company. Your typical company is riskier than the average company. It's done better than the average company in terms of stock price performance. And now I'm going to add a third characteristic to the companies. Your companies have generally been good companies. And that's the exception. Remember that graph I told you, companies globally? Your median company earned about 4% more than its cost of capital and about 5% and, and about 5 .5 more than its cost of equity. Some of you, though, had an issue with your companies where your return on capital was higher than the cost of capital, but return on equity was lower than the cost of equity, or vice versa. So let's start with the question. What might explain why the two measures give you different judgments about projects? Yeah. One is subsidized debt, right? If you get subsidized debt from the government, Brazil, for instance, a lot of Vale has subsidized, used to have sub Embraer used to have subsidized debt. If you get subsidized debt, what might happen is because people are lending you money at below market rates, your cost of capital is depressed, so your return on capital can beat your cost of capital, but cost of equity is not subsidized. So that's a scenario where excess returns from a capital perspective can be positive, and excess returns from an equity perspective can be negative. What about the reverse? In fact, this is a big issue in today's markets. Because return on capital, we actually net cash out. We look at operating income without interest income. But if you have a company like Apple, in its book equity, there is a substantial amount of cash, right? And that cash earns what rate of return? Close to zero, 1% maybe. If I compare that to the cost of equity and conclude the company is taking bad projects, it's incredibly unfair. Because that cost of equity reflects the business you're in and the risk of the business. So I'd be very, so if I had to pick one, I'd pick the return on capital measure over the return on equity measure simply because it ha doesn't have, and if you have non-operating as assets and holdings in other companies, the return on equity and cost of equity can give you a very different answer because you're bringing those cross holdings as well into your return on equity process. Okay? So when people talk about return on equity, that's something to keep in mind is return on equity is a noisier measure. So on average, your companies are riskier than average. They have done better than the market on average. Oh, one final question. How do you reconcile having a negative uh, you know, Jensen's alpha with a positive excess return? No. I thought it was good to take projects that make them more than your cost of capital. So how can you reconcile the fact that companies that are earning more than their cost of capital can end up with negative Jensen's alphas?
The market is an expectations game, right? If GE delivers a 5% return on capital next year, they look like heroes. Even though it's, it might be below the cost of capital. Why? Because the market might be saying, this company is so bad it can make only 3%. In contrast, if Google delivers a 25% return on capital next year, investors will be disappointed. It's incredibly unfair. But the better you've done in the past, the more the expectation. This is why at some point in time companies hit a wall. It's not that they're doing well, but they have to keep doing so much better than expected. And at some point, the expectations game not only catches up with you, it goes past you. That's what makes a company like Amazon so astonishing, right? It's a company for 22 years that's managed to set expectations high and managed to beat it. And part of the reason I think it's been able to set a story for the market based on its terms rather than the market terms. Prashant? Uh, if, uh, if your company is moving over like this kind of risk, yeah. That's a lot of, lot of things you've added on. So they did an acquisition. They overpaid on the acquisition. They're over levered as well. So which one are you punishing them for? Right. You have lots of good reasons and why the Jensen's Alpha should be negative, right? That's an easy case, right? You're, not, you're saying, which of these 17 reasons should I attribute to why the company's done badly? The trickier thing is when a Netflix has a negative Jensen's Alpha or a Google has a negative, because you're saying, I thought this company was a great company. So the tough companies to explain are the ones where all of the numbers on the ground look good but the stock price does badly. And people say, well, that means markets are inefficient. That's not true. It's got nothing to do with market efficiency, at least at that level. It's got everything to do with how expectations get set and whether you can beat expectations. Right? So then I asked you to compute the optimal debt ratio of your companies. So basically in this graph, you can see the, this gray, brown, whatever, whatever that color is. That's your optimal. There's your actual. You can see on average that your optimal debt ratios tend to be higher than your actual. In fact, your median optimal debt ratio is 30%. If you want a rule of thumb, I guess you can take the 30. The 25th percentile is 20%. The 75th is 40%. 50% of your companies are optimals between 20 and 40%. But there were at least, I think, I counted you know, 12 firms which had 0% optimals. You're saying, why the optimal debt ratio be 0%? What are the things that will drive your optimal debt ratio to 0%? One is very low, no, low operating income was only part of the low operating income relative to market value of the firm, right? Because it's, if you have low income relative to the value of the firm, because debt ratios are computed relative to the value of the firm, let's say you're a $100 billion firm with a half a billion operating income, you won't be able to borrow. And here's why. You get a 10% debt ratio. 10% of 100 billion is 10 billion. You have only a half a billion operating income. Your rating is going to hit double C, single C very quickly. That's why high growth firms will tend to have lower optimal debt ratios because the growth pushes up your market value. And as firms mature, the optimal debt ratio will rise, not because the operating income has risen, but because the value has compressed towards the operating income. That's one. What else? Tax rate. If you're in a low tax locale, in fact, if, you're in, if you have any of you, I think at least three of you did Middle Eastern companies and ended up with optimal debt ratios of 0%. You could have seen that coming, right? You put in a 0% tax rate and say interest is not tax deductible. I've taken away. Really, the only reason to borrow money from a financial perspective. You might still borrow money because you have control needs. But you're opt there were at least four companies in this class where the optimal debt ratio was 90%. Why? Because their operating income is high and their value is low. The one thing you have to be careful is the operating income reflects what they made in 2018. And the value reflects what the value is today. You're saying, how much could have happened in four months? Well, some companies, lots of things can happen in four months. The bottom can fall out of the company, the market value. So I wouldn't jump out there and borrow the 90% until I figured out whether the operating income is going to stay at what it was in 2000. So I looked at what percentage of your companies were under levered, and 62% of your companies were under levered, 38% were over levered. 
That's a statistic that's been pretty much stable for the last 20 years that I've taught this class. Uh, it's about two-thirds under-levered, one-third over-levered, and it's exactly what you should expect, right? Why? Because if you're going to make a mistake, you'd much rather that you be under-levered than over-levered. So I'm glad I'm not finding 80% of companies over-levered. That would be a scary prospect. So one of these semesters, I'm going to put up a statistic that's 60% over-levered, so run for the hills. This is never good for an entire market to get over levered. But it could be, yeah. It could be that the money losing companies are the ones that are over levered. But the correlation between losing, many of the money losing companies you avoided were actually young companies, right? If you look at money losing companies in terms of percentages, for every one you know, money losing old company, there are nine money losing young companies. Right? So, and on, on average, and actually there's a different, there's an actual different, there's a contrast between what happens on average and what happens in the median. The average, I just took the, the difference between the optimal and the actual, and I computed the average across all companies. And if I look at that average, it looks like the average company is over levered by about 6%. But the median company is under levered by about 6%. And that comes basically from the fact that there are some companies in, in, that you picked which were very, very over levered by 50, 40, and that's pushing up the average. Yeah. Now, in terms of the right kind of financing, I told you to stay away from that, to try the macro duration spreadsheet that I have, but I said the numbers are going to be all over the place. Just go intuitively. And we know how to design that. that you, know, you look at what kind of projects you have, and, ask, and you try to match the debt up. So if you have really long-term debt, you should have you know, long-term assets, you should have long-term debt. If your you know, assets produce cash flows in euros, your debt should be, so basically you're matching up the debt to your assets. And of course, the way we use the macro variables is by looking at how your company changes relative to a macro variable, I can get clues about what to do. So by running a regression against interest rates, I'm getting a clue about the duration of your assets, the duration of your debt. By running a regression against GDP changes, I'm getting a clue about how cyclical or non-cyclical you are. And that could affect how much margin for error that I have been borrowing. I look at inflation, I'm getting a clue about pricing power. But remember, these clues you could have got without running these regressions by just taking a look at what your company does and how it behaves during recessions and inflation. But the end game here is you want to design that, that be better map. On this one, I kind of cut you some slack because if you are really within the firm, you could do this much better. Because the breakdown that companies give of their debt is not rich enough for you to say, hey, that's the wrong kind of debt for you. But if companies actually gave you a breakdown of debt by maturity, by currency, by floating and fixed rate in enough detail, you could say, well, this is not the right kind of debt for you given your assets. Unless you had a Turkish company, in which case you could start off with the presumption that they're doing the wrong thing. And maybe cut them some slack. Because why are they doing the wrong thing? They're using euro and dollar debt to fund their assets. The rest it becomes academic. You've basically broken corporate finance's basic rules on debt design. And then towards the end of the class, we started looking at giving cash back. And to measure how much your company could give back to its shareholders, I said look at potential dividends. Potential dividends, it's a fancy word for what's left over after you've met every conceivable need. So you start with net income. You add back any non-cash charges, primarily depreciation, amortization. You subtract out what you need to reinvest, capital expenditures and working capital. If you can take some of that from debt, you net that debt out saying, look, I paid for this with debt. And if you have debt payments, you make sure you make those debt payments of preferred dividends. In effect, think like the owner of a business. You're writing checks and checks come in. You're looking at the cash left in the till at the end of the year and say, this is what I could have paid out. We called it free cash flow equity, but again, think of it as a potential dividend. And I ask you to compare that to the actual dividend. And here's where you saw the distribution become very bimodal. You had a lot of companies which paid no dividends, and, and this includes buybacks as well, because the dividends plus buybacks. A lot of companies which did nothing, and even though they were, had positive free cash flow equity. The other extreme, you have companies that are returning more than their free cash flow equity, the form of dividends and buybacks. Doesn't mean they're irrational. In fact, give me some good reasons why companies might return more than their free cash flow equity. 
they're declining and they're in the face of the business where, where they're giving cash back. The second is they have a mandatory policy. Remember Vale, right? You've got to keep paying the dividends. You're stuck with them no matter what. The third is that they had a bad year last year, right? This was just last year's numbers. If you used a five-year number, then it gets more difficult to use that argument. But basically, as you go through, you can see that dividend policy is the least explainable aspect of corporate finance, right? Because companies do strange things, either because it's mandatory or because it's inertia, or it's because of the, what they've always done. So trying to explain what companies do on a company-by-company -company basis can be really messy when it comes to dividend policy. And finally, we got to valuation. And if you think about valuation, it's just capital budgeting revisited in a bigger format, right? And I said there are two ways you can approach valuation. One is to focus on equity cash flows, free cash flows to equity, and discount them back at the cost of equity. And the one thing I kind of emphasize with any kind of valuation model is don't make growth an exogenous input, a number you make up, because any valuations are unbounded. If your company is in steady state, its margins have settled down, its growth rate can be written as a product of how much it reinvests as a retention ratio and how well it reinvests, captured with the return equity. That same return equity used to judge the company now comes back into the growth and equity earnings. If you're looking at the entire firm, you're going to discount cash flows of the firm, pre-debt cash flows at the cost of capital, and there the growth is going to be a function of how much you reinvest, measured as a reinvestment rate, the percentage of after-tax operating income that goes back, and how well you reinvest as a return on capital. So superimpose this on that earlier phase of the project, and you're going to see how much that early analysis becomes the foundation from which you value a company. So as you're passing judgment on hurdle rates and how good are my projects, you're building the foundation to value a company, which also means that if you sit down to value a company without a sense of its hurdle rates and the quality of its projects, it's going to be very difficult to actually put a number that makes any sense. Okay. Now, in terms of the tying up of loose ends, how, what you do after you're done discounting depends on what you discounted in the first place. Oldest discounted cash flow model out there is dividends. You discount dividends back at the cost of equity. What you get as a present value is the value of equity. You're done. If you discount free cash flows equity at the cost of equity, you get the value of the entire equity of the firm. You still have to subtract out the portion of your equity you gave to your managers as options because you get only whatever's left over. But if you discount free cash flows of the firm at the cost of capital, your job is just beginning because you have a lot of loose ends to mop up. You got to add back cash. Why? Because the interest income from cash is not part of your operating income or your cash flows. You haven't valued it yet. You got to add back cross holdings, minority holdings in other companies for exactly the same reason. Because the income from those cross holdings are not part of your operating income, not part of your cash flow. You got to subtract out debt. Why? Because you're equity investors. You got to pay that debt off. And if you have consolidated a 60% or 70% holding, you might have to subtract out the portion, the minority interest, because it's very much, you've double counted. You acted like you owned 100%. Only then do you get a value of equity, and you have to subtract out options to get to the value of equity in the company. So if you remember, as, as, we, as I asked you to do this, and I said, look, you know, I know this comes at the tail end of a class and you had only like a week to pull things together. So I said, no valuation, I'm not going to kind of look at the details because that's for a different time in a different place. But I, in this, this graph, I've actually compared, uh, ba I, I'll, we'll go to the comparison first, but here's what you found. You found that the average company across your 275 is overvalued by about 35%. But I think that number overstates what you actually found because your median company was overvalued by only about 7%. Again, there's, this, there's the outliers out there. The first, about 50% of your companies range between being undervalued by 7% to overvalued by about 47%. 41% of your companies came out as undervalued, 59% came out as overvalued. And just for comparison, I've got spring you know, numbers pulled out from different semesters. I had this going back to the 1990s. Okay? So you can see what it looked like before the dot-com boom. In fact, my valuation class, I used it to show whether you can predict what the overall market will do based on what people find collectively. It's like a group analysis of the market and companies. Okay? 
But basically, you know, there's, there have been semesters. I remember in 1999, for instance, the percentage overvaluation was like 80%. <laughs> People had a really tough time even getting to numbers, the peak of the dot-com boom. You know where, I mean, the 7% is pretty much on par for what you find because you're, and there might be things that are being missed in a DCF, but 7% you're well within the noise term in the equation. And finally, in, when, once we got the mechanics of valuation nailed down, we said, how do we change value? And to change value, you got to change one of the four inputs, right? You got to increase your cash flows from existing assets by cutting costs, being more efficient, maybe paying less in taxes. You can increase the value of growth by either reinvesting more if you have projects that make more than the cost of capital or reinvesting less if your projects earn less than the cost of capital. You could reduce your cost of capital, and by now you know how to do it, right? Change the mix, get better you know, debt that matches up to your assets. And finally, if you can put off getting to becoming a mature company by building up your competitive advantages, everything we do in business is somewhere in there. Every class you take is somewhere in there. Your marketing class, your strategy class, your ac accounting, I don't know. But, no, but most classes are in there. In fact, one way to tell classes that should be in the business school and classes that should not is if it doesn't show up there, why the hell are you wasting your time on it? So in a sense, that should be really the, I mean, it's, it sounds like you're being very mercantile, but this is a business school. And being mercantile is where you start this process because if you can't connect it to the numbers, I promise you it will not happen. I mean, this has always been my pushback against corporate social responsibility is unless you connect being a good company to what it means in terms of numbers. You know what? We'll talk a good game, but we won't play it. Everybody's annual reports, what do they show you? How great they are as a company. Take a look at Uber and Lyft's annual reports. Half the report is about how much good they do for society and how wonderful their drivers' lives are. Of course, they kept it a complete mystery from their own drivers as how their lives got so wonderful because they're saying, how did, because I ask every Uber driver, I, you know, especially for the last couple of weeks, I said, I read in the Uber annual report that your wife, life is wonderful. <laughs> what do you think about this, Anne? I haven't got a single Uber driver agree with me yet. No, but this is exactly what we get when we make it all talk, is we create an ecosystem of people who can talk the talk. You can make a living writing C CSR language, but unless we connect it to something that matters, okay, it's not going to stick. So I took Disney, and if you remember, I valued Disney as is. So this is the status quo valuation of Disney I did in November of 2013 with Bob Iger running, right? So let's say you come in as CEO of Disney. By now, I've given you a sense of what Disney does well, what Disney does badly, what it could do differently. What are some of the things we could change at Disney? Just in terms of pure numbers, but then we can put some flesh behind how you change. You know that mix of debt and equity, they were 11.5% debt, 88.5% equity. Could they borrow more money? Yeah, in fact, when we did the optimal, we concluded they could borrow 30, 40 percent debt. They've chosen not to. Okay? They are making more than their cost of capital, but if you break their businesses down into their five businesses, it is conceivable that some of their businesses, they're making very close to their cost of capital, some they're making more. For this, you probably have to get in the inside of the business. Investing more in theme parks better, investing more in movies better. Okay? And given how well the Avengers and... You know, Star Wars and it, the movie making business has clearly been, at least for the last five years, much more lucrative than everything else. ESPN was the, the cash cow in 2013, but it's become a thinner cow, right? The cable cutting and all of that stuff is showing up as lower cash flows. So maybe, maybe you could earn a higher return on capital or reinvest more in some businesses. So here's what I did. I took what I'd learn through my, you know, all, all the stuff we did on Disney through. And I changed a couple of things. One is I changed the debt ratio to the optimum, which lowers their cost of capital. Second was I said maybe they've done so well on the Marvel and the, Star, and the Lucas Films acquisition, they could do small acquisitions. I never foresaw a Fox 81 billion. That's not what I mean by selective. That's like you know, taking a blunderbuss to the process, something more refined. 
slightly higher growth rate, but with those change, so I'm not being unrealistic. I'm saying, look, you know, you reinvest differently. Maybe your return capital can be, so I'm actually asking them to reinvest less and reinvest a little better. The value that I get is 74.91. So the value I got before was 62.56 with my changes put in, 74.91. The, you know, it's a little hubristic to argue that this is, op but let's call this the optimal value, that if the changes were made. What should I call that difference between the two values? I have a status quo value, and I have a value with changes put in. Let's call this the value of control. This is ultimately the value of control, right? What do you think you can extract as a higher value by changing the way a company is run? You could actually value control in each of your companies. Do you want me to add this on as one more thing to be done before five? No, no. It's, no, this is something you already have. Every, you have the ammunition. You did the optimal debt ratio. You looked at the projects. You looked at the dividend policy. You can effectively take everything you've done as part, of the uh, as part of the class and say, if this company were run differently, what would the value be? And for some of you, guess what? The value you're going to get with the changes made might be very close to the status quo value, which tells you what? This company is pretty close to optimally run. The value control is going to be close to zero. For some of your companies, you could get double the value if it's run differently, in which case the value of control can be immense at these companies. It becomes a simple way of looking at how much is control worth, and it's definitely not worth 20% at every company. One thing that um, you do when you talk about values, you forget that markets don't value stocks, they price them. And we make a big deal about this in the valuation class, but I'll make a big deal about it again because we try to explain prices with fundamentals when in fact prices get driven by mood and momentum and shifts in things that you can't even control. Doesn't make it bad, it's just different. The pricing game is different from the value game. And if you look at how Disney is being priced rather than valued, it's being priced relative to other companies, whether it's Netflix or whether it's other entertainment companies or other large market cap companies, we really don't know. It might actually shift from period to period. But in the pricing game, you look at how your company is being priced relative to other companies. And the problem with prices themselves is they're kind of arbitrary. Sounds like a strange word. They're arbitrary because if I do a two-for-one stock split, my price changes, right? In fact, when I valued Uber the first time around, because the prospectors had left the number of shares kind of unclear, I basically had to make up some, you know, added up some numbers. I used like 1,160 million shares to arrive at a you know, value per share of 50. But my total value of equity was 62 billion. Of course, two weeks later, when Uber came out with the specifics of share count, it's closer to 2, two billion shares, not 1.1 billion. And if you take my 62 billion divided by 2 billion, you get 32, 33 dollars per share. It's roughly 1.86 million. Okay. My value of equity doesn't change, but as the share count changes, the value per share can change. And what we do when we price is therefore standardize the price. We divide the price by something, price by earnings, price by book, EV to, by, a multiple is just a standardized price, and then you compare across companies. The essence of pricing is you're no longer doing a discounted cash flow valuation. You're saying, how is my stock price relative to other companies like it? Obviously, that's not part of this class, but something to think about when you think about why values can diverge from prices. So I took your 275 companies, and I looked for your most undervalued stocks. So if you have one of these stocks, you can, you know, you can come in and chat with me about whether you're actually putting your money in the stock. Now, you might be a little too premature to do that. You're saying, I don't have any money. That's an easy excuse to use right now. now there's your value per share. There's the price. It's, that should be 56 points. So I don't, know, I don't even know what. Um, that might be 56 cents. I don't know. What, uh, so let's, let's ignore delta. Something is wrong with the numbers there. It's not my fault. I just cut and pasted whatever you send me, right? So whatever it is, I'll have to go take another look. But let's look at the rest. Sun Power, the value per share is 66. The price is $7.38. If you're right, there's a lot of upside in here. And that's the, so I've just listed out the stocks that came out as most undervalued by comparing the value to the price. And then I look for something that I always look for in a corporate. I call this my triple whammy. Here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for stocks that are under, in this case, under levered, 
are building up cash and are undervalued. You see why these companies are interesting companies? If you are an acquirer and I give you a company that's under-levered, undervalued and it's holding back cash, everything is lined up for you, right? They're under-levered so you can borrow money, they've built up cash so you can use their cash, and they're undervalued so you get the stock at a bargain. I mean, if you, you know, people talk about merger arbitrage, that's an oxymoron. Because what they often do is they, after a deal comes through, they try to speculate on whether the deal will be completed. But if you really want to base an investment strategy on potential, because remember, the way you make money is by getting into companies before they become targets of acquisitions. You could start with this list, but then what's the next test you want to run? I mean, these are companies that acquirers are interested in, but you might want to look at how many of these companies are voting and non-voting shares and take them off your list. You might look at, you know, so essentially all that corporate governance screen, which is, not a, which is more of a qualitative screen, you can run on these individual companies. And if you can find a company with very limited corporate governance protection and all of these things, you buy seven of these companies, even if one of them gets taken over. And that's all you need. This is a very heavily skewed. If you can get a one in six or one in seven hit rate, that's all you need for this portfolio to do well. So, so we're back to the page I started this class with. So let's review and let's make sure we've got at least some more flesh now than we did in session one. If we don't, we're in big trouble. Okay? The investment decision says invest in assets that earn a return greater than your minimum acceptable hurdle rate. The hurdle rate should reflect the riskiness of the investments you're taking. And how do we measure risk? With equity, we measure it as risk you cannot diversify by an abater. With debt, we measure the default risk and a spread and should reflect the mix of debt and equity. Those are the weights used in your cost of capital. So the cost of capital is our attempt to estimate the hurdle rate for a company. And the return should be based on cash flows, should reflect when the cash flows happen, and should have all side effects built into them. So we, that's what discounting does. We project out the cash flows. And when we add things like synergy and uh, options to do other things, we try to bring them into the cash flows rather than deal with them after the process. That is the investment principle. The financing principle says find the mix of debt and equity that maximizes your value. In the shortcut we use, we look for the mix of debt and equity that minimizes the cost of capital. But we also looked at adjusted present value and you know, any way in which you can say, if I change my mix, I can increase the value. We also added to that a second part of the principle, which is match up your debt to your assets, because by doing that, you reduce your default risk, reduce your cost of capital, and increase value. And the dividend principle says, if you cannot find investments that make your hurdle rate, right, give the cash back. Whether you give it in the form of dividends or buybacks will depend on what kind of stockholders you have and how they get taxed. But if you decide to hold back the cash, you're going to be okay if investors trust you. And that trust is going to be based on your history. So when a Google holds back cash, it holds back cash from a position of strength saying, look, we've done good projects with your cash, trust us with your cash. Dividend policy is built on trust, but how much you can return in dividends depends on what kind of projects you have. And in doing all of this, you have a singular objective. You want to maximize the value of your business. <coughs> everything has its place in corporate finance, and every part of what you do is connected to everything else. So if you decide arbitrarily to raise dividends, it'll have consequences because it's going to affect your investment policy and your financing policy. If you decide to borrow more money, it's going to throw off the, you have to think through the consequences of how everything plays through in this game. It's been a long semester. I started this semester, what, what is this, February 1st, 2nd, something like that? And some of you know I've been commuting this semester. I come out every Sunday night on the red eye from California. I get in Monday morning. I got in at 5 this morning. I stay Monday and Wednesday, and Wednesday night I take the flight back, which is part of the reason you haven't been able to find me on Thursday or Friday. Yeah. And I could give you lots of good reasons. I'm two blocks from the beach. I can see the, you know, I can, the weather's always 70 degrees and sunny. But um, I'll give you the biggest reason. That's Noah Henry, my grandson. I get, to see, I get to see him every, every, every week because he lives in Burbank with my son. Um, 
but um, I now this is this is my permanent commute now. So I now I'll teach only in the spring. I know there are all kinds of rumors I hear about me. <laughs> in these rumors, I'm teaching at UCLA. I've taken a job at Berkeley. I've you know got a chair at Stanford. I'm doing you know X. I'm running a hedge fund. I'm very curious about these rumors. They make me sound. I do nothing the rest of the year. <laughs> I walk my dog to the beach, I sit on the bench, and I just walk, watch the ocean. If I feel a thought coming into my mind, I might write about my blog, but I live, live a very limited life in terms of uh, I have no big ambitions anymore. I just want to coast through the rest of my life. So, you know. <laughs> but I'll revisit the three, three objectives I gave you at the start of the class, and I hopefully have at least moved closer to it. First, I said this is a big picture class. And I know as you get lost in the details, it's so easy to get lost in that getting that beta right or getting the effective tax rate at the second decimal point. Step back, get some perspective, right? Because this, you know, if you get the big picture, you're going to, you know, the key is to know what to spend time on and what to kind of gloss over. And that comes only from working with numbers. Because when you first do it, everything looks equally important, right? It's only as you work with these things that you realize that never mattered, right? But to get there, you've got to work through the numbers. I can tell you it doesn't matter, but it's not, not going to have the same effect as you finding out it doesn't matter. Okay? Second, I said, no, we're going to talk about the tools. But ultimately, unless you can apply the tools, there's no point talking about tools. So when you talk about these tools, remember, everything has to be applied, which also means you've got to be pragmatic. If you're a purist, you'll basically find reasons not to do things. If you're a pragmatist, you'll find reasons to do things. And this is a class where basically I want you to apply those tools. And finally, the third objective I won't even bring up. It's too painful right now. But maybe a few weeks from now, you'll say, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I'll take that. It's not quite fun yet, but it wasn't that bad because Ultimately, you know, this is, this is about business. It's about managing businesses. And even if you're never going to take another finance class, if I've done that to you, that's fine. This is all the finance. You really, there are no advanced corporate finance classes. People ask, what, is, what can I take as an elective? You're done. You got the thing nailed down. You want to get, no, you want to get better at corporate finance? You know what you should do? Pick another company. Don't do it right now. I mean, it's a, <laughs> right now, the, the wounds are too fresh. Wait a few weeks and pick another company and take it through the process. You're going to find that the second time you do this will be much more speedy because you know exactly where to go. And if you do this on seven or eight or nine, because remember the Bloomberg packet is pretty much, the blue, you can pick it up for any company you want. And by the seventh or eighth and ninth company, you could basically turn around a corporate finance analysis over the, you could print off at nine o'clock, be done at noon because you got the process. I actually have a spreadsheet that I haven't released to you that does a whole class <laughs> in terms of the numbers. Because the numbers are not the issue here, right? Basically, in the first input page, it asks for all the numbers, and it does the whole thing. Bang, cost of capital, hurdle rate, capital structure, dividend policy, valuation, out at the other end. Because my point is that the numbers are not what separate. I mean, this is not rocket science. It's about how we use the numbers. And so for many of you, you got a debt ratio of 60%. You say, I don't feel comfortable with that 60% for this company. And I said, go with that discomfort. Because in a sense, you're saying there's something about this company that leads you to believe that borrowing that much could get them into trouble. Don't fight it. The numbers are your starting point. They're not your ending point. So if you're wondering how I'm going to grade your projects, they're going to be done very speedily because I have no choice. Now, because I have to get them the grades back quick enough that the final grades come through because some of you are graduating. But I'm looking for insight. I'm looking for, you know, the optimal debt ratio is 30%. How do you take that and tell me something about your company? Because that's really, that's really the skill that you need because the numbers, you know, you could probably have, you know, you could probably create an app in your phone. You enter the numbers, it gives you optimal debt. It, it, there's nothing here that you cannot mechanize. And that should be scary. Because if it can be mechanized and all you do is mechanical stuff, you're one step away from being outsourced. So it's, it's in consulting and banking, my concern is so much of this advice is now mechanized. It comes out of cookbooks that there is no differential advantage. I mean, if all you're doing is 
plugging in things. So learn to work with the numbers. It's not going to come easily or right away, but the more you work with the numbers and you think about them and you start to put flesh on the numbers, the richer your analysis will get. One final thing, don't forget to do your CFEs. The reason for that is very simple. You cannot check your grades if you can't do your CFEs. This is a very personal reason I want you to do the CFEs, because when you can't find your grade, guess what happens next? You email me about your grade. I don't want to be answering emails. What's my grade two weeks from now? Just do the damn CFE. Okay? And, it's, I, and I'll close with a story. About um, tw 34 years ago, I taught my first corporate finance class at UC Berkeley. It's an undergraduate corporate finance class. I still remember the class was called BA 130. I was terrified. I was a third year PhD student. You know. And of course, at the end of the semester, you get CFEs back and I'm reading through them. I don't, I, know, I gloss over my CFEs now because you know, I'm old and decrepit and what can I change? I'm not beyond. But there I was you know, ready to change and I read the CFEs and you know, it's too much work, too little work and do this, do that. And then I, this is Berkeley, circa 1984. I get to CFE, says, wear more earth tones. <laughs> this is the CFE, wear more earth tones. And I said, you know what will happen if I wear earth tones? I'm brown, I wear brown, you wouldn't be able to tell me apart. If I have a background that's brown, you wouldn't even be able to see me. So, you know, so I'm used to all kinds of CFE, so just get it out of the way. I think it's already open, maybe, and I'll send you the, the, the link you need to get there. Just get it done, get it you know, over. Now, I, you, know, you want to give me one, is it out of five now? No, so whatever it does, I just, get, just get done. I just don't want to be sending individual grades out to people. Okay? And of course, if you don't like your final grade, then of course you can email me. That's it. Thank you very much. And I will see you perhaps next spring. I, I, I will be teaching valuates exactly the same schedule next spring. So valuation mostly for the second year is corporate finance and valuation for the undergraduate. So.
Slides, I'm actually going to show you what the numbers have looked like so if you bought the buys and sold the sold sells, the sells okay. you can do it in one year or five years. Yeah. Right. I was wondering like for you as an investor, like there's top of the valuation here, are you able to get any excess returns? I have, but I don't I couldn't <laughs> tell you whether it's because I did a good valuation or luck. Luck is okay. so much an inseparable part yeah. and it takes what two fifty years before you can actually establish that luck is not a factor. None of us are gonna be alive at two fifty. Okay. But so far I know whether I've been lucky or good, but you know, it's okay. amazing. So it's one of the two okay. things. You can't really yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Great. Take care. See ya. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Professor, I want to thank you for the, the semester. You're welcome. It was very inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm doing a lot of projects based on what you, what you taught me, and hopefully next semester I can send you an email with all the good news that happened. <laughs> projects in other classes? No. Or projects um, in life? In life. Okay. You'll, you'll like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Take care. Hi, I'm Rachel. Hi. Nice to meet you. This is such an inspiring class. Um, I was an accounting minor, yeah. and I really liked what you had to say. I say mean things. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I could tell you some of my best right. friends are accountants, okay. but they're it's not. It's completely but different from finance, so I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, the class was great, and I learned a lot, and I really liked this project, too. Yeah. It forced you to use everything that you were talking about, so yeah, thank you. Per, it can be personal, you know, it can be really But it feels good when it, when it works, you yeah. know, it feels good in the end. So, okay, thank so you. I'm excited for the final, and you're here for this one, too. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good reason to commute. Yeah. Right. He's, yeah. Yeah, he's 14 months old. Oh. Yeah. Thank you so much. First one? First one. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe he'll be a Disney Channel star. Who knows? My, my, <laughs> son, my son works at Disney. Really? Yeah. Can we mention yeah. that? Yeah. 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 He gets into Disney for free because his dad can get him in. So he's, nice. he's been to Disney already like 12 times in 14 months. So he okay. just goes, <laughs> they just walk in on a weekday and kind of, you know, he's 12 months old. Yeah. Thanks again. You're welcome. I just also wanted to say thank you. I really appreciate the class and the dedication. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually had a question about yep. my valuation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you're looking at the cash flows and you estimate the growth rate, I had a company that has acquired a lot of companies over time. So you look at the, the revenue kind of be constant and then it jumps up. Um, when I'm looking at or estimating the growth rate, do I include those acquisitions in there? It or on what story you're telling about the company. Is it done or is this part of how they grow? It's okay. part of how they grow, but I feel like when you – Investment trade left and include acquisitions, I think the return on capital is going to re- reflect the judgment on whether they're good acquirers, useful acquirers, or valuable company acquirers. So you get higher growth, but remember, growth by itself doesn't create value. It's the return on capital you give them. Right, but I, I guess that's where did that come in when we did the ultimate valuation of the discounted cash flows? Because it's through, through the return on capital. So the, let's say I increase your growth rate because you do a lot of acquisitions. So let's say I decide that your acquisitions are leading to be at above value. I'll give you a high reinvestment rate because you do a lot of acquisitions, but I'll give you a lower return on capital because you overpay. So that's how it sets up the reinvestment capital is much higher than it should be because you overpay. Okay. You take a high reinvestment rate and a lower return on capital, you might end up with a higher growth rate if you don't have a return on capital. So value growth is a function of not just what the growth rate is, but what return on capital companies are growing. And that's where whether you think this company is a, maybe it's a very disciplined company in terms of acquisitions. Maybe it acquires small companies with promising technologies, in which case you're going to be looking on giving them a high reinvestment rate because you'll have to normalize things with acquisition tends to jump around. So on average, they invest about 70% of their outside of operating income going to its acquisition. Mm-hmm. They're also a good company in terms of acquisitions. They earn 4% because remember, their current return on capital would reflect their history of acquisitions. 
our interest only capital is below the cost of capital, your story gets like <laughs> this or something else. Right? Because you then have to tell me what they're going to do differently yeah, about acquisition and yeah. 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 And for you, the question of whether you take goodwill out and leave goodwill in in yeah. acquisition is a huge yeah. one. Yeah. Right? Because you leave goodwill in, you know, for capital, your returning capital is probably lower than the cost of capital. And they're looking at whether they're not going to have goodwill in the past is going to give you a few percent of some goodwill. Because you can look back at the last 10 years, and you've impaired goodwill three times in the last 10 years. It's not a good sign. And it's on average, they're really overpaying, and they get laid off into the expense of it and so forth. So with that sort of a company, you have to make the judgment of how they're done. Some acquisition companies basically couple of days acquisition, you say, okay, they're done. Don't have any business today. So I say, look, $81 billion acquisition, these guys are done. They've got some of my cash left in the drawer. So when I forecast the future, I'm going to focus on non-acquisition driven But if they're consistently acquiring other companies, you have to make those judgments. Okay, makes sense. Well, thank you for the class. Well, it's one of my favorites. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank for you. This class. Where, where are you from again? Bolivia. Bolivia. Yeah. That's, an unusual, that's an unusual destination for us. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm Bolivia. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to Ecuador, not Bolivia yet. I was supposed to go to Bolivia and back to Ecuador. My interest in the class has reached to such a level that I, I just bought a domain name for myself. I want to do all this stuff. And the first company which I want to do is because I have have been having a debate with one of my friends mm -hmm. in India mm -hmm. who wants to value data ways as a brand rather than just show me numbers, what underlying numbers and he still feels that way. You can value data ways to the routes to that. That's why people buy it. There's no brand. Right? Right. Nobody pays a premium for data ways versus Indigo. Correct. Right. In fact, if you put up a real discount because Indigo probably is better regarded just like the right. right. But from the airlines, it's Getting routes is a regulatory ticket. So if you can buy an established company's routes, you're essentially giving them entry right. to the game. So you can actually value the Jet Airways infrastructure you're buying. Maybe the aircraft they have and the routes, it's more the routes than the aircraft. The aircraft is probably or the aircraft the not the one that they're using. But the, uh, the routes themselves. So it's not the brand now. Basically, the route, but which means that even a shell company mm -hmm. would still have the right to those routes to be useful. The only problem is you have to sell it to the company. Right? So, if you buy the company for the shell, you also inherit the credit. So, that's the problem. So, you can buy the shell without the, 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 the lender coming in. But, like, how is it that they, they say that there's already going to honor their uh, membership, like the miles and everything which they have. So they they pay whatever they want. Right. What credibility do they have? When you're bankrupt, how can you do anything? Exactly. Right? That's you can't even get the aircraft off the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Forget yeah. about honoring membership. You can't even honor the tickets you've already sold. Yeah. So you can tell what it, you can say what you want, right? Yeah. None of that matters. Exactly. At this stage, is what can I do with those aircraft and drugs? And maybe the membership route, you can you, know, you can say, look, I'm selling a subscription there. Right? That depends on how loyal these members are to Jet Airways. And you guys say there's not a whole lot of loyalty because it's not exactly a mileage plus program you want to spin those miles on. There's value there, but I'd be very cautious about all these stories. You know? right. uh, I'll definitely share that with you because I'm having a heated debate with him every day. And because he's like forcing me to value it as a brand, saying that, okay, like Horlicks was sold in India for like 2.1 million. Horlicks like was a brand, right? People right. recognize the brand. They were willing to pay a premium for the brand. Who pays a premium for Jet Airways? It's yeah. out of you. So yeah. it's not a brand. It's something else. So don't tell them it's worth nothing. Because that's not true. Just tell them that it has value, but it's nothing to do with the brand name. It comes with the regulatory approval it's already got for the routes. Right. 